This story was told to me by my high school librarian, who also taught a Shakespeare class. This was to preface her own ghost story on how she saw the Chapel Hill ghost light. Apparently, she went down to Chapel Hill all the way from her college town to see the ghost herself with some friends. When they arrived at the tracks, it was a summer night around 10 p.m. They hopped out of the car and started down the railroad tracks looking for this ghost light. A light appeared in the distance and it was slowly swaying. Getting a little closer to the light, it became more erratic. At one point, it started heading their way where they retreated back to their car and headed back home to the college town. I was a senior in high school when I heard this story and I was very skeptical. I thought to myself, no way, and googled the Chapel Hill ghost light. And oddly enough, a lot of people have seen it themselves. I still thought it was a farce, but I had to go check it out myself. This was an odd time with not much else to do either. Four kids from my school just got expelled for partaking in illegal substances and practically every one of my friends was grounded by this. I went to a small school and we all hung out with each other. So when that ship sank, the whole fleet went down. Regardless, I convinced my twin brother, one of my buddies who was looking for something do, and the basketball team manager, and we hopped in the car and headed down to Chapel Hill after a Friday night basketball game. Chapel Hill was about an hour and a half away from Nashville and we were not prepared to say the least. It was a December night and awfully cold. We only had one flashlight that was powered by a battery and needed to be charged. After researching on Google, we found the optimal place to park the car for the voyage. Initially, we passed the railroad track and had to double back using someone's driveway. Once we got settled, we looked down the track and there was a very faint light. We didn't think too much about it since it could have been anything. The building, another intersection for a road, or the ghost light. This light was about 100 yards away, so we started to walk towards it. However, once we started walking towards it, circumstances changed. First, the temperature dropped, noticeably. It was already winter and about 30 degrees, but all of us noticed a significant temperature drop once we started down the tracks. Secondly, as we got closer to the light, it would move farther away from us. Mentioned before, it was about 100 yards away, which isn't that far away. We walked about 100 yards towards it on this railroad track in the middle of nowhere, and it would move with us. Thirdly, the stagnant light started to sway very slightly. It was a gentle sway, where we could conclude that it wasn't a fixed light. It could have been the wind swaying the light, so we kept heading towards it. We walked about another hundred yards and the light kept its distance. However, the swaying got erratic as if someone was looking for something near the side of the tracks. Truthfully, this got all of us scared, but we really wanted to get to the bottom of it. We walked about 50 more yards and the light started coming towards us and our flashlight died. We booked it back down the tracks and got into the car and got the hell out of there. In the car, we checked the flashlight and it still was showing it was fully charged and was working properly. My parents were the first ones to move into our house. They watched it be built, so having so much activity seemed really weird to me at first. Then I learned the history of our land. Apparently, a lot of the people in my area used to find our heads in the field where my house is now, and is rumored to also be the site of an Indian burial ground. I'm not so sure if it is or not, but my best friend's family did confirm the lot that a lot of arrowheads were found. So even if it isn't a burial ground, people most likely died in our land. Not only that, but all the women in our family are quite sensitive to the paranormal, especially my mom, cousin and I. My mom has always said I was sensitive, even as a baby. I knew when people died before anyone else did. I'd stare at one point 
are absolutely nothing. And I still to this day hear and feel stuff. When I was two, my mom's friend's granddaughter died. Before mom got the call, I was pointing to the sky and saying, there goes the baby mommy. The same thing happened when Dale Earnhard Senior died saying, there goes the NASCAR man before it was announced he was dead. I wouldn't sleep in my own bedroom until I was seven because I always felt something bad was in there with me. I've always been able to sense when there was another presence in a room. I still do to this day, especially in my basement. My basement is a finished and furnished basement, not some dark creepy one. When I was little, my parents made the one room into a playroom for me. I would refuse to play in there unless someone was downstairs with me. So my dad ended up turning another room downstairs into his own little man cave for that reason. We used to have a camper that I would play in and one day I looked out the window and thought I saw my dad standing outside of it, wearing dark jeans and a black shirt. I needed to ask him something so I cleaned up and went over, but couldn't find him. So I went up to the house, but he was inside on the computer, wearing a red shirt. When I asked if he was out there and came in to change, he said he'd been in there with the same shirt for hours. My brother used to see a woman in white and could describe her in perfect detail, right down to the colour of her hair. I would not leave my room at night until I was 11ish when we got our dog because I knew something was in the kitchen, always watching. When I was 12, I was at my friend Sarah's house, which is definitely haunted. I closed my eyes and saw a horrific scene play out. I saw a man in black chasing a young girl, no older than seven or eight, and she ended up falling over the banister above the dining room. I still remember every detail of the girl, from her curly brown hair to the buttons on her blue and white dress. Records of the girl are unsure since it was a long time ago, but a man did die in that house not too long ago. 1940s, I think? Maybe a little later. At the age of 13, my friends and I did an EVP in a cemetery across from her house, and after we heard a noise, I asked if they could do it again. It happened again, and we bolted out of there. At 14, I was at my friend's house when my mom texted me, and told me something pulled on her hoodie when she was doing the dishes. Trigger warning, abuse and miscarriage. When I was 19, I moved into the hotel I worked at to get away from my physically abusive ex. A month into living there, I found out I was pregnant. Now, this hotel is known to be haunted and actually has frequent ghost tours by a group of paranormal investigators and has even been on the travel channel I lived across from the most haunted room in the hotel, and I honestly think that made my depression even worse. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, and quit taking my epilepsy medications. I constantly heard and felt things around me in that hotel. One day while working, I was cleaning in one of the rooms and felt a burning sensation on my back. When I lifted my shirt up, three scratches began to appear on my back. The paranormal group I mentioned above did an EVP session afterwards, and after 20 minutes of voices saying, we didn't scratch her, one voice said, Michael did it. Michael is known to be the little boy that wanders the hotel looking for his mother. Not too long after, I found out I was pregnant. I was actually really excited and saw this baby as the light at the end of the tunnel. So when a couple of people from the group came to the hotel for a birthday party, we went back to that room for an EVP with me there. When asked why it scratched me, it said protecting her. Then when we asked why and from what, it said she's pregnant. It didn't say what from, but I later found out. There's another ghost in that hotel that I didn't piece together until it was too late. They call her the lady in black and I 100% believe she took my baby from me. A co-worker told me a story about when his friend was going through the yearly haunt they have in October. A lady in black told her she was going to steal her unborn baby. Not too long after that, she miscarried. After losing the baby, I moved back in with my mother. 
A few months later, the power went out in the hotel where I was working. When I was going to the bathroom, I heard a petite voice say, Mommy? I cried for hours because I knew, knew that my baby was trapped there. End trigger warning. A year ago, my mom was laying in bed and started falling asleep. She opened her eyes for a second and saw a face staring down at her. She didn't dream it, she was still awake. In 2019, I moved into an apartment with my best friend, not knowing it was the scene of a murder-suicide until the lease was signed. I don't believe they're still there, but you can feel the residual energy where it happened. There are multiple entities in that apartment though, one of which seems inhuman. A week ago, my boyfriend was over and he woke up at around 6am to see a creature crawling on the ceiling. The same thing my best friend saw after we moved in. In January of 2020, I had recently got out of the hospital and my best friend had to go to her grandparents' house. So my downstairs neighbor slash friend said she'd come up and stay with me. As we were laying in bed, she opened her eyes and said, not to freak you out, but there's a man above me staring at me. Obviously, I freaked out. I'm back at my mom's place until my boyfriend and I find a place of our own. And lately, for the past year or two, I've had to cleanse the house once a month or else the activity really picks up. I still feel negative energy at night. This happened around the end of November of last year, while I was at a late night party at a mutual friend's house. The night started off fine with us having a few drinks and talking about the classes we'll be having next semester. This pretty much went on till around 2am and by this time I wanted to go home since the party was already dying down and most of my friends already left and I was practically there alone. Instead of wasting money on an Uber, I decided to walk home since my neighbourhood was a few blocks away but it was still a decent walk. However, there was a shortcut. There was a secluded dirt road in the neighborhood, which led to a stretch of walkway with an irrigation canal for crops. And it happened to lead straight to the backyard of my house. I began making my way to the lonely dirt road and I started to second guess my decision since that stretch of walkway can be pretty shady, especially at night because a few drug dealers and junkies like to hang out there. I mustered up the little courage I had, feeling confident that I'd be able to handle myself if shit ever hit the fan. So I proceeded to walk on the desolate road. The night sky was well lit. The moon illuminated my surroundings enough for me to see my environment pretty clearly. The walk was actually pleasant. The only thing that made it tough to navigate was the overgrown thorny weeds and mesquite branches that kept scraping against the exposed parts of my skin. As I continued to walk through the brush, I finally got to the clearing that led to the bridge and to my relief, there didn't seem to be anyone in sight. As I began to cross the bridge, I then picked up a faint scent of lavender mixed with something rancid, like the smell of good cheese or days old roadkill. I couldn't tell where the smell was coming from, but as soon as I made it to the other side of the bridge, the environment seemed to suddenly shift. It's hard to describe, but I felt this heavy pressure wash over me, like being submerged underwater, coupled with this gut feeling telling me that something about the environment was just off. I pushed this feeling off as a random anxiety attack since I do get them sometimes, but deep down I knew this was different. To calm my nerves, I stopped walking and slowed breathing and began to count to 10 while clenching and releasing my fists to try and shake off this bad vibe or whatever it was off of me. When I finished my little ritual, I felt slightly better and more at ease. I started to walk in the direction of my house until I heard this odd grunting sound coming from behind me. I turned around and I saw a woman with short black hair and silky white gown crouched down with her back turned away from me. She was just a couple of feet away from me and it was strange because when I crossed the bridge, I didn't see anyone around the area. Did I pass her without even realizing it? I thought to myself. She was hunched over after all, and I do tend to get caught up in my own world. At this point, 
the faint smell from earlier was just overbearing. So much so, it started seeping into my sense of taste. I covered my mouth with the bottom of my t-shirt, trying to shield myself from it, while I yelled out the muffled words, Hello mom, do you need any help? She paid no mind to me as she continued to make that weird grunting noise, and I was creeped out at this point, so I walked away a couple steps and I turned to get one more look at her. She then decided to stand up, still with her head back turned to me and muttered the word muerte, which means death in Spanish. Confused, trying to understand what the strange woman had said to me, she then slowly turned to meet my gaze and all the blood in my body pulled in my gut when I saw her face. It was extremely long, too long for a normal human body to be supporting it. The head of this thing almost resembled that of a horse or a donkey's head and the eyes, I'll never forget the eyes, as much as I've tried to. They were gaping pits of blackness, surrounded by a sea of red. A complete silence fell off the area as I was terrified to stone by what I was witnessing. My brain, a scrambling mess, was trying to make sense of the unnatural abomination that was before me. The creature then decided to let out what I can only describe as a high-pitched scream. Like a cross between a pig squealing and woman wailing, my fight-or-flight reflex then kicked in and I started sprinting to my fa house as fast as Usain Bolt. I didn't even bother trying to unlock the gate to my fence. I jumped over it with ease. My grandmother saw when I came barging into the house. The words couldn't leave my mouth to tell her what I saw, as the fatigue quickly kicked in after the adrenaline wore off. But afterwards, I described to her what I had seen. With a look of urgency, she then decided to perform a cleansing ritual that removes the involves rubbing an egg all across my body in three circular motions while chanting a special prayer. She then cracked the egg she was using into a clear glass cup that was half filled with water and when she did, the egg came out with streams of blood and the yolk that came out of the egg looked similar to a human pupil, which was a very bad omen for the person who's been cleansed. After seeing this, she laid her hands on my forehead and chanted another prayer for about a minute and threw the raw yoke out of our house and into the driveway. She didn't bother saying anything to me till the following morning. She reluctantly told me that what I encountered was an entity that specifically preys on men, kind of like a succubus, and told me that this thing had very dark and malicious intent, and I was very lucky to have gotten away from it. To this day, I haven't set foot on that stretch of road. When I was 13 years old, my mother wanted to pay respects to our grandfather, who passed away some time ago, especially with Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. Around the corner, she wanted to leave my grandmother a small token of affection, to let her know she's still in our thoughts. So my mom, my younger sister and myself went on a trip to the cemetery where she was buried. To drive there was always the hardest part since the cemetery is really out of town and it takes almost around two hours or so just to get there. Keep in mind, this was pre-smartphone era. When we finally got there, I remembered we had to park far off into the distance, since the entrance didn't have paved roads for cars, and the terrain itself was very dense and wooded with mesquite trees and weeds, with the exception of a small, semi-cleared area where a large, old oak tree stood. The name of the cemetery was Rio Grande City Cemetery in Texas, one of the oldest cemeteries in town. It's been around since 1848. We made it inside the compound where my grandmother was buried and we all got together and said a small prayer and laid some of my grandmother's favorite items on the gravestone and she continued to pray. While my sister and I started to explore the cemetery and the various types of towering gravestones and weathered statues that riddled the area, we then started to pick up a faint smell in the air. It wasn't overbearing, but it was noticeable. It had a musty, rancid quality to it. Thinking nothing of it, my sister and I continued exploring the surrounding area. It was at this point my boredom got the best of me 
and I snatched my sister's Barbie doll she brought with her for the trip. And I started to antagonizing her into chasing me. Yeah, I know. I was an ass back then. Luckily for me, she was never a fast runner and I easily ran almost halfway through the vast cemetery while trying to look back to see if my sister was still chasing me. I tripped on one of the older gravestones and fell face flat on top of a really old gravesite. Just as I was getting up from my fall, I felt the ground beneath me start to shake and this freaked me out. So I grabbed my sister's Barbie doll and sprinted back to where the entrance was, out of breath and shaking. I met up with my sister who was already by the car, angrily waiting for my return. It was at this point where the faint, rancid smell from earlier began to grow. It was suffocating. It was odorous enough to reach all the way to where we were parked. Our mother, who was already making her way back to the car, even acknowledged the foul odour. It was nauseating enough to make her gag. I then started hearing what I can only describe as a scratching noise coming from the tall oak tree. It's almost as if something was clawing at the base of the oak tree. My sister heard it too, and that was enough for her to get in the car and push us to do the same. As we all got in the car and began to drive off, I noticed someone coming out from the back of the oak tree. It was a thin, pale woman in a red dress. She looked bruised and disheveled. The odd thing that stood out to me was that the look on her face. She had a malevolent grin from ear to ear. It was the most unnatural, unsettling smile I've ever seen on a person. My sister, petrified, also saw the woman in red dress. And as soon as she came closer out on the road, my sister started shouting at the top of her lungs, why is her leg twisted like that? Make her go away. It was at this point, I noticed that one of her legs was twisted in an unnatural fashion. It was almost bent all the way backwards. She then stretched out her arm as we were leaving while doing this. She was saying something in a language I didn't understand, but we were already too far off to catch anything she was saying at this point. And to be honest, I don't think I'd want to know. I haven't set foot on that graveyard since this happened, and I don't know if what I saw that day was real or not, or if I just imagined the whole thing. I don't even know if my sister remembers the whole ordeal, and to be honest, I can never muster up the courage to ask her. But I did ask my mother if she remembers anything from that day, and she said she does remember the rancid smell. A while back, I was going through a tough time in my life where I felt like I was stuck in a perpetual rut without any sight of immediate change. I lost my job, I was out of money, and I had to move back in with my folks to prevent myself from becoming homeless. It almost felt like as if everything I spoke into existence was immediately doomed to fail. I started praying to God in hopes of gaining some strength and wisdom to get through this challenging part of my life but it seemed like all my prayers fell on deaf ears. I was already at the end of my rope. Then I went down the rabbit hole of YouTube and I started to take a deep fascination into the occult. My interest led me into the darker aspects of magic and ritual summoning. I was aware of the general biblical lore of demons and the whole fallout with God, since I was raised in a semi-Christian household. But I wanted to know more behind the lore so I decided to do my own research and I studied the hierarchy of demons and their power over mankind, as referenced in the 22 Lesser Keys of Solomon. I learned about kings, dukes, princes, marquises, counts, knights, and presidents of hell. Each of the highest to the lowest of these entities have the power to bestow great knowledge and destruction and confusion onto people, while others have dominion over the elements reversal of fortune, the ability to reveal sacred knowledge and bestow great wealth onto whoever the entity desires. This appealed to me the most since I was at a real desperate point in my life where I was looking for anything to remedy the situation. I finally landed on a demon I wanted to summon, Clownek, a demon said to be greatly cherished by Lucifer. Due to its power over wealth and influence, over the heart of man to replace money is the idol of worship. 
as a test to see if anything would happen, and I drew its sigil on a piece of paper on the floor. And then I got myself into a meditative state where I focused on the sigil, channeling my energy and desire into it for what felt like a good 10 minutes in total. Afterwards, I was pretty exhausted and I wanted to fall asleep, seeing as it was already pretty late and nothing happened so far. However, I did feel this really odd sense of someone watching me. You know that feeling you get when you know you're being watched? It felt like that. Around 20 minutes into my sleep, I found myself tossing and turning, still unable to shake this feeling of being watched. Then I started hearing small taps all along my room. I knew it couldn't have been anyone in the house since my folks were already fast asleep and I was the only one up at this point. I decided to do some investigating outside and there was no animal or wind that could have been generating that noise. And the house itself is old, but to my knowledge, it never generates any sort of noise. I tried to shake it off as just being a rodent or something. So I climbed back into bed, shutting my eyes to go to sleep until I felt this invisible pressure on my legs. It almost felt like someone was sitting on my legs and I started feeling this static like sensation all over my body. At this point, I got up and I was creeped the hell out while hearing the same tapping noise all along the room. I went into my living room and grabbed a Bible and started reading random verses from Psalms to Revelations. And I was shocked because the voice that came out wasn't my own. It was deeper and malevolent. I continued reading passages of the Bible till the other voice faded and my normal voice returned. It helped a little, but I still didn't sleep that night. To this day, I still hear on occasion that incessant faint tapping noise and on occasion, I still feel like I'm being watched at every dark corner I pass. When I'm on my way to sleep and I finally find a comfortable position to lay, I usually can only sleep if I'm facing towards the middle of the bed. This thing will come up and I can feel my bed react to something climbing onto it because it sinks down a bit. It then proceeds to just lean over me and breathe as close to my face as possible. I can literally feel it. When I don't react to that, open my eyes. I can feel it get off the bed from behind me and get back on the other side so that we're face to face. I know this because I can feel the bed react again to it getting on the other side and now feel the breathing right in front of my face instead of over me. You know when someone gets really close to your face, you can feel like the heat coming off their face? That too. Lastly, with still no reaction from me, it gets off the bed again but I know it's still in here just from the feeling you get from someone staring at you. Here we are with the thought that of course, this is sleep paralysis. The whole story is generic to exactly that for the most part. This is why I don't think that I can move. I'm not immobile. It doesn't feel like anything is holding me down. I know I can move because I'm so used to sleep paralysis that I know how to check for it as this is how I usually transition to a lucid dream. That's a whole different story. The way that I sleep, I have one hand under me, usually under my pillow, so I just open and close my hand a few times to confirm I can actually move. This works for me in my head because if there's something there, I can move a little without it knowing. I then move my legs to get up into a fetal position just to make sure my feet are not hanging off the end of the bed. Too many stories regarding that. Now that I know I can move, this is where I start to get nervous because now I have to actively try to keep my eyes closed. Since I have confirmed I'm actually awake, it seems to be right in my face at this point. I can literally feel the sweat coming out of my pores on my entire upper body because I'm so nervous. What I have done the last few times when I know it's not on the bed anymore and I'm drenched in sweat to the point I need to move off of the wet spot, I say fuck it and jump up from my bed and yell as if that's gonna do anything. When I do though, of course, nothing is there. I grew up in a farm town, and the only place to get groceries besides the grossly overpriced shock po on the edge of town 
was a family-owned supermarket, Robertson's. The Robertson family was very active in the community, but also had a reputation from misery to straight-up evil, depending on who you asked. If you asked me and the rest of the bag boys, Robertson had a dark aura around it. Many features contributed, like the vaulted ceilings in the back rooms, the creaking floors in the upstairs offices, and the door hidden behind a pile of old shelves that seemed to lead under the loading dock. The worst was the patriarch of the Robertsons, Blaine. He was too old to handle the business decisions, but he was too stubborn to let his troupe toting son take it out of his hands. So he spent his days shuffling around the floor, antagonizing the bag boys at every turn. He'd chastise us for clocking in more than one minute early, He'd chastise us for standing at the clock with a minute left in our shift. He'd chastise us for our laziness the second we weren't actively moving items. I always joked that Blaine was a vampire. He just refuses to die. Why else is there never a call over the intercom for kids who lost their parents? One night, my suspicions were reinforced. Blaine had showed up about nine to take care of some office work upstairs. With all of our closing duties done, my partner for the night and I lollygagged in the stockroom, right at the foot of the office stairs. When 10 rolled around and it was time to close, I figured I'd let Blaine know we were locking up. I started up the stairs and suddenly noticed it was dark. I got to the top and looked around. Not a single light in the office was on. We had stood at the bottom of the stairs the whole time and Blaine hadn't passed us. Even when Blaine wasn't looking like Nosferatu, Strange things happened upstairs. The exposed water pipes leading upstairs twanged like someone hit them with a hammer. Footsteps on the creaky floor echo through the whole back room. All of this happens when offices are pitch black as we stand next to the stairs. One night, my partner and I got freaked out by the noises from the offices and decided to spend the remainder of the shift lapping the store. But as we walked perpendicular to the aisles, a can of green beans halfway down the vegetable aisle suddenly fell off the shelf. We put it back in place and started walking again. Two aisles down, another can fell off. This time, as I put it back in place, a can 15 feet down the aisle flew off the shelf. We left that one sitting and huddled around the cash registers for the rest of the shift. To top it off, a bag boy requested to be taken off night shifts after an experience he had in the break room. The break room has two small bathrooms, male and female. He was taking his dinner break when he heard a baby crying from the women's bathroom. He had been in there five minutes already and hadn't seen anyone come in, much less with a baby. He endured the crying for five more minutes before he got concerned and knocked on the door. Repeated knocks and questions got nothing back except for the non-stop bawling. He was finally convinced something had happened to the mother and cracked the door open. The room was dark and empty. A couple years ago, I interned at a coal mine north of Gillette, Wyoming. The coal field outside of Gillette is the largest in the world home to several mines spread throughout the gently rolling plains and sparse woods. I've heard of several encounters and experienced one that only seems to happen when the coal fields are hit by storms. The area around the mines used to be a popular Sai region, and as such, there are several artifacts including teepee circles. My mentor during the internship showed me a group of teepee circles on our property. They sat on a flat, green patch of ground next to a gentle stream. As peaceful as it was, he explained that he always shudders when he has to come to the stream to perform water tests. He had come out during a shower on a gloomy day, and as he was taking his samples, he heard the grass rustle. Except for the patter of rain, the air was completely still. He heard the rustling coming from the direction of the teepee circles, and as he walked closer, he thought he could hear a murmuring, like many people going about their separate business. He quickly collected his samples and left. Since then, he does his best to bring someone along when he has to go out there. Just a few dozen feet away from the teepee remnants is a rail trestle that crosses the stream. The trestle is part of the spur, 
the loop that brings trains into and out of the mine with loads of coal. My mentor said he wasn't the only one who experienced strange things in this area, and that several conductors and engineers, during blinding thunderstorms or white-out snowstorms, have seen a lone figure wrapped in a colourful woven blanket trudging down the side of the track. In addition, though tools have been known to be stolen from the mechanic shop and pawned off, there are never so many reports of missing tools as when the rain is drumming on the metal roof. As for myself, my commute was about 20 minutes, and I would leave at about 5am every day in the dark. One day, in the middle of a particularly stormy summer, I left the house in a real frog strangler. The drive was a fair amount of hills and dips, and I saw headlights coming the opposite way, probably another mine worker coming in from the night shift. I lost sight of them over the hills a couple times, and the third time, the headlights disappeared. No car passed mine when I created the final hill. When I passed the spots where I had lost sight of them, there were no turnoffs on either side of the road, and even if there were, there were no sign of headlights anywhere around me. This year was his freshman year at UNL and he moved into a four-person dorm room with three of his high school friends. The dorm was virtually new, only three years old. The room consisted of a common area that split into two bedrooms. The guys in one bedroom had a standard freshman experience, lots of drinking and making out. My brother's room had something strange about it though. It started with a knocking. Occasionally, when my brother and his roommate Connor were asleep, they'd hear the distinct sound of rapping on wood. Thinking it was the guys from the other room, they'd answer their door, only to find them asleep. The knocking persisted though, happening a few times a week, always around 3am. Eventually, they realised the knocking wasn't coming from their door, it was coming from their closet. After the knocking started, Connor's girlfriend brought up the way he talked in his sleep. This concerned him, because he had never done it before. One day, my brother was in the dorm alone. All three of his roommates were in class. He was playing Xbox when he heard a loud cough. He checked the entire suite and found nobody, which was a formality considering the cough came from right next to his head. One spine-tingling night tied it all together for the two of them. They had, the, they had heard the usual knocks and my brother had trouble sleeping. While laying in bed, my brother walked Connor suddenly sit up in a sleepwalk-like trance. He turned slowly to the couch and pointed at it. Why is that man watching us, he asked, and collapsed back to sleep. The two got jobs as summer RAs in a different dorm and were relieved to be away from the room. However, the thing seemed to follow them. Connor still complains about strange noises at night and a very eerie incident occurred just about a week ago. My brother woke up at 3am and walked down the hall to the public bathroom. Water covered the floor. He saw it pouring from under the door to the maintenance closet. The hall director was the only one who had the key to the closet. When he finally showed up and unlocked the door, a faucet was turning on full blast. There was no way into the closet without the hall director and yet, something had cranked the faucet. When my brother and Connor initially thought was something haunting their original room, now seems to be following them. Connor, a former skeptic, is now terrified to be alone. What prowls the dorms of UNL, waiting for the witching hour? One night, we visited two graveyards along with my dad's girlfriend, Denise. The first was the municipal cemetery for our decent sized farm town. It was fairly standard until we came to a specific spot. A year ago, one of my dad's friends had lost his son as an infant. We decided to visit the grave, more to pay respects than anything. After my dad stared in silence for a couple minutes, we moved on. 
Just before we left, I turned around and snapped a picture. The air around the boy's grave was buzzing with orbs. It was a quiet winter night, all the bugs either dead or hibernating. But here, above the gravestone of a tragically lost baby, the air was full of activity. It's been many years since then, but I'll do my best to find the picture. After that, we visited our town's historical cemetery. It's home to the original settlers of the town from the turn of the century. Even the youngest greys are only from the 30s. Our time there was pretty quiet, but as we were leaving, my dad found an ancient hubcap right by the gate. Since he and Denise were extremely interested in antiques, he grabbed it and threw it in the bed of his pickup on the way out. A week after our hunt, they were going out of town for a charity event and asked me to house it. I was alone in the basement, messing with my dad's AR-15, because I was a teenage boy. Denise had an elementary-aged daughter who was also gone, so I was completely alone. Suddenly, there was a massive boom from upstairs. I grabbed the gun and made my way upstairs, imitating a SWAT guy slicing the pie. Her daughter's bedroom door was closed. She always left it wide open, and the carpet was so thick that it took an adult shouldering it to get it closed. I shoved it open after a lot of effort, and there was no one inside. Someone or something had slammed the door shut, despite the massive amounts of force it took. Things escalated when Denise woke up one night to the sound of the connecting door to the garage opening. Half awake, she looked up to see the silhouette of my dad standing in the bedroom door. My dad worked night shifts, so she welcomed him home and fell back asleep. She woke up later, again to the sound of the garage door opening. When my dad walked into the bedroom and said hi, she asked him where he went. He explained that he had just gotten home from work. A couple days later, she had been in bed again when she felt a hand gingerly brushing her hair. After a few seconds of frozen terror, she rolled over to see no one there. A week after that, my dad was off work. Both of them were in bed. He opened his eyes to see the apparition in full form. He was a man in early 1900s evening dress. He stood over Denise, brushing her hair. Despite the vision of a man standing over his girlfriend, my dad said in that moment, he felt nothing but serenity. The apparition had a kind and somewhat sad look on his face. Was this man one of the orbs around the infant's grave? Was he attached to the hubcap we found? Or did he just see in Denise the face of someone he loved in life? Regardless, my dad vocalised to whatever it was that it was welcome to stay, as long as it meant no harm. From then, all was quiet in the house. My father, my brother and I have always been believers in the paranormal and throughout our lives we've all had our own experiences which I might talk about later. One of our favourite bonding activities when we got bored was to go out to one of the local graveyards and ghost hunt. We always carried an EMF meter, a decent camera, a big honking railroad lantern from my dad's days in Union Pacific and a phone with an audio recording app. One night, I had a friend visiting from Pennsylvania and we decided to go a hunting. We had come up empty handed for the first few minutes, although our flashlight and our camera seemed to be losing power quite fast. Then, a pack of coyotes, probably at least half a mile away, got riled up and started howling. This was not uncommon since we lived in rural Nebraska, but my friend is a very high strung guy and lives in a Pennsylvania metro so the coyotes gave him creepy crawlies. Suddenly, something that was clearly not a coyote let out a massive bay. I'm not a zoologist, but it sounded far too low to be a wolf owl and too loud and primal to be someone's sheepdog. I turn to my friend with a big grin and say, that sounds bigger than a coyote. This is the last straw for him. And so me and my brother walking back to our truck while my dad is off at the other end of the cemetery. My brother and I start walking back to where my dad is, 
when he comes sprinting through the headstones, panting. He said he was walking along when he suddenly saw a bright light like a camera flash. He brought his camera up, said, are you fucking kidding me? And snapped a shot. At first, my immediate thought was cigarette smoke, but my dad had quit smoking only a couple weeks ago. Our grandpa had died of lung cancer when we were young, and my dad and my brother had both been in tears when we begged him to stop smoking. My brother had kept tabs to make sure he didn't relapse. The picture quality isn't great, and it's far easier to analyze in full resolution. My dad's convinced that the wisp to the left is the arm of the apparition reaching for him, and the head and the torso are on the right. But when we aren't with him, my dad goes out on his own. He had a job as a night shift trucking dispatcher, and when he was bored, he'd use his brakes to walk a graveyard and record EVPs. He never caught much of anything until one day he found a fresh grave. It was a reinterment, and he started reading off the gravestone and asking why it was so fresh. He mispronounced the woman's last name and quickly corrected himself. It was only later, when we listened to the audio, that we heard an annoyed murmuring in the background after he mispronounced her name. It definitely had an I'd like to speak to a manager quality. He was alone in a prairie graveyard at 3 a.m. with hardly even a gust of wind. The only explanation is that someone was very annoyed that he couldn't get their name right. Over the years, my family has had many strange paranormal experiences. Today, I thought I'd share the most incredible and frightening one. If you like it, I might share other experiences my family has had. When my dad was about eight, he was having breakfast at his grandmother's house. It was a family gathering. He and his parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents were all gathered. While they were in the living room enjoying coffee, one of his aunts showed up with laundry. She was a college student and used my great grandmother's washer to avoid paying. She went down to start her laundry. The basement of my great grandmother's house had only one entrance and one exit to the basement. In the basement, the washer and dryer were partitioned off with a simple curtain. After a few minutes, his aunt came back up from the basement. She looked at my dad and said, that was a pretty funny trick you pulled there, Doug. I didn't even hear you. The rest of the family looked confused. Eventually, someone spoke up. Jan, no one's left the room since you showed up. She suddenly went as white as a sheet. After calming her down, they coaxed an explanation out of her. When she had finished with the laundry, she opened the curtain. There was a pyramid of folding chairs stacked in front of it. Have you guys ever had a deja vu where first it happened in a dream? You're in a place you surely have never visited before. Then sometime in the future, you see the exact same place in the dream long ago, even when the place has not yet existed prior to the time you dreamt of that particular visit. I had a terrible nightmare once when I was a young boy. As best as I could remember now, I was around five or six years old when I had that nightmare. I was at the preparatory level at that time, and believe it or not, it's not like I forgot about it right now, I just couldn't recall it that easily, and I never knew that I will always remember a moment from that nightmare. That was the only thing I remember from it though, and it all came back to present memory because of last night. And I'm certain I had the nightmare because when I was young, me and my mother always slept beside each other in our first house, and that nightmare was the worst in all of my childhood. My mother, as she recalls it with me a few years later, would always say she once would simultaneously vibrate my chest with her palm and strongly say, singing, singing, singing. To this day, I don't know what it means, but the elderly and the suspicious in my country always use it to calm someone down from extreme shock. And I know my mother only calmed me down with that once because they believe it effectively drastically goes down when used more than once. 
All the details from that nightmare that had me crying while sleeping were vague and I couldn't even remember that I had it a long time ago in my memory, progressing to something awfully familiar, to something scarily reminiscent. Weird, but I remember it like remembering the multiplication table, like it was just there. Already there, but you can't just randomly burst it out the same way you remember and say your name. You just need the trigger to completely recall. From what my memory recalls, the room was small. It had a simple and round wooden coffee table on the left, almost in the centre near the wall. It was dark, but it had a shiny brown light radiating from a candle from the coffee table, which filled the area of the coffee table and lit the dirty white wall behind it, the wall I was facing. And from its right was a round arc-shaped entrance to another part of the building or house. There wasn't a door, just the round arc-shaped entrance which even by the darkness got its shape highlighted by the candle from the coffee table to see. My perspective from that nightmare was me facing ahead all those details and I couldn't move nor do anything else. It was like sleep paralysis but I was sitting down. The arc entrance at the right side of the coffee table gave dim vision to that left side of the round arc-shaped entrance. I know this is a common case, but from that dark round arc entrance suddenly came out a white mahogany mud coloured woman who was fast enough to jump out but everything was so slow when it happened. I couldn't see that face because of its hair covering. It was horribly scary as it moved disturbingly towards me and pounced on me. I couldn't remember what happened after that in that nightmare. Many years later, right now in the present, just last night, I had the same nightmare again, same coffee table by the left, same candle lights on the top center of the coffee table, same dimmed round arc entrance, some darkness, so much the same that it made me scared to remember that it lacked one last detail and it had me nervous expecting the white mahogany mud colored woman figure to disturbingly pounce again, but it wasn't there. Just plain darkness and the kinding light of the candle. As I woke up from the next morning deciding to make an account to find answers on how that could happen again. Same day this afternoon, my mother texted me that we will be spending the Friday evening in our new house, which had just been made two years ago. And I rarely sleep there because I'm far away from college and will always prefer to choose to come home to our first house. I slowly forgot about the nightmare from last night as then I prepped to leave for our second house. It was already evening as I arrived in our second house and went inside. As I sat on the floor leaning on the sofa's base, I find Indian sitting most comfortable, while again scrolling on my phone, I faced as I glanced at the wall of our small living-esque dining room. I felt uneasy as I'm in the same angle of perspective exactly from my nightmare. I see the same size of the room from that perspective. The round arc entrance to the kitchen at the right side. Everything was getting familiar and it struck me cold and with a headache to have this creepiest realization. Except for the round coffee table and the candle lighted darkness, everything else was the same from my nightmare except for the last detail in that horrid memory of a dream. And I couldn't rest easy knowing who knows when the white muddy figure comes out the dark round arc entrance, any time I'm in the room myself. When I was younger, I can't say exactly how old I was, about four I think. My brother and I loved to camp outside our home. In front of the house, there was a small forest. If you went outside, you stood directly in front of this e really small forest. There was never anything spooky about it. We always played in it, even when it was just a steep slope with trees. It was our favorite place to be. Just playing, doing stupid things, being children. It always was my favorite place and a happy place. One day, we decided to camp outside again. We built the tent and at night, we went in it cuddling in our warm and safe sleeping pack. Everything like always. And me, not afraid at all. 
also brave enough to go the like 15 meters to the entrance alone, to go to the toilets in the middle of the night. I went in, a few minutes later, went back out. Not even looking at the forest at all. Do you know the feeling like someone or something is watching you? I had that feeling. I had the feeling that I needed to stop and take a look at the forest. So I stopped. I stopped to look at the forest. And there were two big red eyes staring right back at me. For a few seconds I was frozen because of fear. And after that, I just ran back to the tent and back into the safety of my sleeping bag, shivering in fear. A grown-up told me it was about child imagination, car lights, so I believed them. But I know it wasn't a car because there was no way a car could fit there. From that night, I was afraid of the dark. Years later, my brother told me he also saw those red eyes. I work in a hotel at the front desk. The hotel isn't very old, so you would normally not expect something strange to happen. I work the night shift sometimes, which means completely alone. My first night when my colleague showed me how everything worked and what I have to do, she told me that we do have a ghost. She told me about the sliding doors at the main entrance opening and closing by themselves. And as she tells me that, the sliding door opened and closed with nobody near the door. But not only at the main entrance, also the sliding door at the garage kept opening and closing in the night with nobody around. Not even the presence detector caught anything. The light in the garage wasn't on, but still, I was kind of okay with it. I love spooky stuff, and I didn't have a bad feeling while that stuff happened. But one thing did freak me out. All the other stuff you could have just said it's the electronic, but one night, I heard the elevator ding behind me. The elevator just makes that sound when someone on that floor presses the button. But as you can guess, I was alone. Nobody was around. And the elevator opened and closed, but stayed on the same floor. I also took a look if someone was inside the elevator, but it was empty. Also, on some days, the light in the toilets, also working with a presence detector, went on by itself. And those detectors are not sensitive at all. I can stand in front of them and they need some seconds to turn the light on. So how on earth does it go on in an empty room? Once, while going on my tour throughout the hotel, I kept my phone recording the entrance. After that, I viewed it back and, damn, my phone has a bad quality, but I didn't catch a voice. Or actually, I did. And a strange rattling sound. At first I thought it's me, but you can't see anyone in that video. And if it was me, there should be someone in the video, but there wasn't. Something that also happens often is the light on the fourth floor is going on and off the whole night. That's something I can see from the reception. I don't think guests are running around in the middle of the night, so... Also, I did see some shadows in the corner of my eyes, but I don't see that as proof. Because it's dark, you're tired, it could just be a trick of the light or your imagination. So yeah. My family, mother and brother and I, have lived in this house for around 11 years. There have always been various kinds of strain activities, but now I'm just going to talk about what could be appearances by what we think are some type of doppelgangers. The first time it happened, my mother was alone in the house. My brother and I were at my aunt's house. My mother says that she clearly heard how my brother and I entered the house talking, and she from her room greeted us aloud. When she saw that neither of us answered her, she went to the living room where she thought we would be and found the house empty. Minutes later, my brother and I got home and found her shocked. The second time, it happened to my brother. He was with my mother at home while I was in college. He said he came back from work and when he entered the house, he saw me sitting on the living room couch and said to me, you left early. As he walked to his room, when he saw that I did not answer him, he returned and saw that no one was there. 
The third time it happened to me. It was just my mom and I in the house. I was in the living room watching a movie and she was in her room. I fell asleep on the couch while watching the movie. I woke up because I heard my mom's hair dryer. I turned off the TV and walked towards my room. I passed the bathroom and saw my mom drying her hair. Normally, I didn't give much importance. While lying on my bed, I thought about ordering something for dinner. So I went to look for my mother to see if she wanted something for dinner too. So I went to the bathroom where I had seen her and she wasn't there. So I went to her room and I was surprised that she wasn't there either. I looked around the house and didn't see her. Like it was a few minutes difference between when I saw her drying her hair and when I entered my room. I called her on a cell to ask where she was and her response was she had left the house an hour ago. She saw me asleep and didn't want to wake me up to let me know she was going out. Things like that have been happening for almost 11 years that we've been living in the house. We always see one of us when that person is not in the house. We have heard that my mom speaks to us when she's not there or they've heard my voice or my brothers and it's not like we see them with the corner of our eye. We have seen them directly as a real person. We have a gigantic wardrobe with three parts. The middle door being a full mirror. It's older than me and my mom had made it after she got married. One evening specifically, my mom was in the living room while I was standing in front of the wardrobe in my bedroom. Instead of my upright reflection, I clearly remember watching myself sitting on a bed while talking to my mom who was folding clothes. She had nicer clothes than she usually does when she's at home and was chatting with my reflection self really enthusiastically. I wasn't at all creeped out. I just felt like I was watching TV or something. After a while, my actual mom walked into the room wearing completely different clothes and I told her, look, we're in the mirror. I might have phrased it differently, but she didn't really pay attention and just responded with, uh-huh, that's nice, honey. I've never had anything like that ever happen to me again, which is why I've always remembered that incident really clearly. I saw some people on this sub talking about mirrors being portals to the other side or something, but then why did I see myself and my mom? We've lived in this house for six years so far, but have only really experienced things over the last six months. The house was built in the 1970s and we don't know much about its history. I've been a frequent reader of this community and thought that the experiences I had were only wishful thinking. A subconscious desire to want supernatural things to happen because I've enjoyed the stories I've heard here. But then my wife and sister-in-law have also experienced things. Is this our imaginations or is it something really happening? I have no desire to lie so I'm trying to be honest as possible about what we've experienced. Here's what I have. Around six months ago, my wife had a migraine and saw a woman with blonde gray hair walking out of our guest room at the end of the hall into the bathroom. We explained it away as a migraine hallucination. I am a sleepwalker, but I usually remember what happens during my episodes. One night while sleepwalking, I opened the bedroom door and distinctly remember a woman in a white dress with blonde gray hair standing in the doorway. I remember walking around her. It actually didn't freak me out at the time, but did the next morning when I thought about it. Before I told my wife, I asked her to describe the woman she saw. It was the description of the same woman I saw, blonde gray shoulder length hair in a white dress, maybe around 50 years old. I don't know what the woman she saw looked like before I had my experience. Occasionally, late at night, I'll hear what sounds like someone blowing their nose in the hallway. I always assumed it was my sister-in-law in the nearby room. Last week, I was in the kitchen and my wife was coming out of the bathroom. She said my name. I replied and she said she wanted to make sure I was still in the kitchen, from the guest room next to the bathroom. The same room 
the lady walked out from. She heard what sounded like someone blowing their nose in the room behind that closed door. No one was in there. The entrance to the attic is in the hallway. A couple of weeks ago, we found the entrance in the ceiling pushed up and moved over. It was a windy day, so we assumed it was the force of the wind when we opened the front door. It was still windy outside, but we weren't able to reproduce this. To get access, you would have to push it straight up around three or four inches and move it over. It's also a few pounds and not something easy to move. Maybe it was just the wind. Late at night, we often hear footsteps in the attic and sometimes scratching sounds. There are no raccoons or anything up there. Every time we check, it looks empty with no signs of damage that you would expect from animals. There also appears to be no damage or entry points from the outside. On the day the entrance moved, I was home all day. I didn't remember hearing coming from the attic. My sister-in-law heard footsteps on the steps going down into our basement every now and then. The stairs are near where I saw the woman in my sleepwalking, also not far from the attic entrance in the ceiling. She has also heard people talking in the basement. All televisions and computers were turned off each time. This all seems circumstantial when taken individually, but altogether seems to paint a picture. The ghost, if there is one, doesn't seem malevolent. We don't get any bad feelings or experiences of dread, yet there does seem to be a presence. <laughs>